Okay, so I should start with a couple of disclaimers. The first is my usual disclaimer that I'm a non-exec uh, director at the Competition and Markets Authority, so I always need to say that all my views are personal and don't necessarily respect uh, reflect the position of the CMA, not that I am necessarily going to say anything they would disagree with. Um, but the second disclaimer in for the purposes of today is this is really not a paper like the sorts of paper that are usually given in this uh, lunchtime seminar, which I fairly religiously attend, and I know the sorts of papers that are presented, and this isn't one of them. Um, so it was Julian uh, Wright's idea to invite me to present this, and he claims that uh, we that actually uh, occasionally there are kind of very policy orientated kind of translation uh, papers presented, um, and this is basically one of them. So there isn't a huge amount of economics exactly in there, but the whole thing is kind of underpinned by economics. So and a lot of the economic thinking that this group are doing links into this policy debate. So I think it should be useful. Some of what I'm gonna say, many of you will know, but some of you may not. Uh, hopefully there will be something new uh, for, for everyone. Um, and it's the paper is forthcoming in the Oxford Review of Economic Policy early next year. There's an SSRN uh, submitted version uh, on, on SSRN. So why is my, why is not? going on. There we are. So what I'm going to cover is very briefly the first three sections, I, I hope. Um, what problem is pro-competition digital regul platform regulation trying to solve? Second is why regulation and not competition law, which obviously we're all more well versed in competition law. Um, third, what are the design challenges involved in developing this kind of regulation? The third is what are the pros and cons of divergent regulatory approaches? And the final one is uh, how might these risks be mitigated? So first of all, what problem are we solving? And it is true um, that there is um, a decent case for leave well alone. Um, so we uh, know that digital platforms have brought huge benefits for consumers. I'm not going to go through all these, but for firms, for competition, for innovation. We also know that there has been uh, and can be intense competition to win markets in the first place, and that even if we see monopolized markets, they can still be contestable and kind of schumpeteri and creative destruction idea. Um, and that markets here have been at least very dynamic and very fast moving. So there's an argument that any intervention um, will be at best irrelevant and at worst create serious harm. And I think it is worth bearing in mind all of those concerns um, as we enter the world of regulation. However, on the other hand, we do see a number of digital markets, and this is a um, just a simple uh, figure that looks at European market shares in search, mobile and desktop operating systems and mobile browsers. Um, so a number of really core digital markets which have tipped to being highly concentrated seemingly over the long term that exhibit or seem to exhibit very high barriers to entry and expansion where market power has been or at least risks being extended into related markets creating ecosystem-wide issues um, and uh, also that platforms have bottleneck power over competition in related markets. And in some uh, environments, I would need to explain what I meant by that, but I don't think I need to here. And the issues are global. Um, so this is the market shares uh, in search by continent. And what you can see there is that Google has a very high share everywhere um, except China, where Beidou has a very, very high share. So it's a similar situation in China, but the uh, people, the, the, the parties are different. And so what are the economic implications of that? Um, there are direct, there's a risk of direct harm to, direct harm to end users, because actually, we know that in two-sided markets, even though things are free, zero price may actually be higher than the competitive market price. There may also be, if there's very little competition, uh, reduced quality. There may be excessive data collection. Um, for uh, them, end users may also suffer via the impact on business users 
So for example, high fees to business users for advertising, for example, or for um, um, intermediating a product sale are likely to be passed on. Um, and also if you are a producer of content, so if you're a, um, a publisher, then you, if there's um, if the advertising chain is taking too large a share of the advertising revenues, then there's less advertising revenues to fund content, and that's going to be bad for consumers and users as well. And then probably the most important risk is the dynamic risk. And I know that um, you know there's a big debate about competition and innovation, which I'm not going to get into here. But if you um, if you look at how innovation works in tech, what's clear is that for an innovation to be successful, it needs to have access to data, it needs to have access to users, it needs to have access to kind of the relevant infrastructure that it's going to fit with, so it needs to interoperate, and it needs to have access, obviously, to fair reward if it's successful. And for uh, many potential innovations um, and many of these aspects, the biggest tech platforms essentially control these things. So they control the access to the data, the users, the infrastructure, and in the end, they control a lot of the reward that you might gain as well. They can also, they're also in a uniquely good position to copy any successful innovations. And they, although they've done a huge investment in innovation in the past, their incentive to invest themselves is clearly reduced the more that they don't feel assailable by other um, innovative rivals. Um, there can be sympathy and creative destruction, clearly, um, but there's a growing feeling that while that's possible and it may occur in certain markets and maybe TikTok is going to be the destruction of meta, we don't know, that it, it can't be relied on to solve these problems. Um, and none of this covers all the stuff around political power, um, online harms, democracy, uh, resilience risk, etc. This is just about the competition side. Another key point is that many of the key drivers of what we're seeing here are inherent in the economics of these markets. And again, you know, this group have, have discussed lots of these, but the huge global economies of scale and scope, the network effects both within platform and ecosystem wide, the data feedback loops. So you uh, collect data uh, by providing these services, but the data is also a key input to the production of the services. And the more data you have generally, the more uh, or often the higher quality the products you can provide, which again, then wins you more customers, more data, et cetera. Um, and then also I think important in this space is the cognitive limitations of end users and the ability to, really be quite granular in manipulating the choice architecture that end users um, see. You can do constant A-B testing to make sure that basically the choice architecture is playing on consumer biases in the way that that, that most, um, it may be do it in good ways in some ways, and you're, you're designing to make, uh, designing in, um, your user interface to make consumers have a nice easy consumer journey, but that can also have, it can also be used in uh, more exploitative ways. And even making an easier consumer journey can kind of inadvertently create um, harm as well. So, and these factors all apply across markets as well as within them. So that really drives ecosystem growth. And that's even before any strategic firm behavior so and deliberately anti-competitive behavior, deliberately anti-competitive mergers, and there has been that too. So the key question then is, can ex post competition law deal effectively with all of this? Um, on the plus side, there has been a huge amount, as many of you will be aware, of activity in the competition law space. These are a whole set of cases uh, internationally that have got to fruition. There's lots and lots of cases ongoing, uh, many more than this, but this is the ones that have actually got somewhere. And they so they have been successfully used to change conduct in the digital sector. 
on the negative side, um, there are concerns that, um, and I think, you know, these con I've put concerns, but they are, I think these are very serious concerns, that ex post competition law enforcement, it takes an awfully long time, is very backward looking. Um, so you're always looking, not, you, you can look a little bit prospectively, but inherently you're looking pretty retrospectively in these uh, relatively dynamic markets in these tippy markets where you need to act quickly sometimes if you're going to stop them from tipping and once they've tipped it's it's too late or it makes it a lot harder ex post competition law enforcement is very narrowly focused typically so you need to make things narrow to create a decent story that's going to get through the courts but then if you end up with these kind of narrow apparently somewhat esoteric cases that are true on the fact that work on the facts that's not so great at creating deterrence uh, given the complexity of these markets and the, the patchwork of different issues arising and the interlinkages between those issues and there's a risk and we've seen some of this already that if you end up with remedies coming out of your ex post competition law enforcement you end up with a kind of panoply of requirements of these firms which require ongoing monitoring anyway sanctions for non-compliance anyway and that's effectively a form of regulation anyway but in a slightly uh ill thought out patchwork um uh, uh way so that's one set of reasons why competition law enforcement is not great but the other set of reasons and i think they're really important is going back to the slide before um many of the key drivers that we see in these markets are kind of inherent in the economics of these markets so in economic terms entry or expansion in these markets may be blockaded in the bane sense um, rather than de deliberately strategically deterred um, and if you've got that sort of situation and you're concerned about the uh, lack of competition that arises then you may need to be more proactive to promote competition than using competition law which is most typically used where firms are deliberately behaving um, uh, anti-competitively. There's a legal debate about whether it can be used more widely, but it typically isn't because it is uh, people are cautious. Um, and then there's also uh, been concerns about uh, anti-competitive mergers. That is somewhere something where potentially um, the authorities could do more and they are starting to do more but over um uh, this is a set of the this is a, just an image of the MA activity by the five largest tech companies over the last uh, 11 12 years um and what you see is an average of nine acquisitions per company per year clearly some of them are going to be fine um you know, the vast majority of these should probably have passed, even if they had been investigated, which most of them weren't, but even if they had been investigated, they should have been allowed. But some of them should not. We could all debate which ones should not. It's a it's a it's a, a, um, a fun game over dinner. Um, but in practice, um, uh, none have been. A few were remedied. Usually the remedies weren't very effective. None were blocked until the CMA blocked Meta Giphy uh, this year. So merger law. Uh, the, and there's a debate about whether to merger law needs strengthening or whether the authorities just need to be braver and think about theories of harm in a more effective and um, uh, brave uh, and thoughtful way. Um, but that's obviously not going to help deal with retrospective issues. So the outcome of all of that is there's a growing consensus, at least amongst um, quite a lot of people, that we need pro competition regulation. Germany actually went first with this, with their amendment to competition law in January 2021. And what that is, it's, it's formally competition law, but it um, allows the regulator to designate a set of platforms that have are, are considered undertakings with paramount significance for competition across markets, which is the um, very catchy up scam uh, digital platforms um, and once you've been designated that reverses the burden like, um, on a whole set of different uh, rules um, such that 
if as long as the um basically you have to show that your that doing your behavior is is good uh, and efficient uh, the german authority doesn't have to show that it's anti competitive obviously if you can show it's good then then they have to deal with that uh, argument back but the uh, it reverses the burden so that is the first thing that happened. Europe, I think, could see that all of the member states were, might well follow Germany. So they wanted to um, develop the, a more formal legislation. And they, you'll all know about this, the Digital Markets Act, which was legislated in September. Um, and the obligations will bite from uh, early 2024. In the UK, um, there was uh, the, UK, the UK started looking at this pretty early with the thing called the Furman Report, which was um, five econom uh, four economists and one uh, con computer science guy um, who in oh sorry three economists, one lawyer and one computer science guy, one of the economists being me, um, and uh, we recommended regulation in two thousand and nineteen, and the UK. Um, government immediately said yes we're interested we will we will look at doing something in fact they've ended up being much slower than Europe but they did create a shadow digital markets unit so that sits within the competition and markets authority and that um, is already thinking about um, what uh, the regulation will look like and what it will need to do and is kind of involved in a whole set of competition at uh, competition law cases and market studies, looking at digital markets issues with a view to informing uh, that regulation. We thought the, re the legislation might have disappeared with more recent versions of our current government, um, but the latest version of our current government has announced um, very positively, very recently in November, um, that they are going to take this legislation forward in the next year. So um, in the US, you'll probably be aware there was a, a hard hitting report in 2020, which then led to five and in fact, in the end, six bills proposed for covered platforms, which like designated platforms. The sixth bill would only apply to app stores um, that came out in June uh, last year. It's some of them have gone by the wayside, but the big one, the main one or possibly two are still going through the process um, because of the most recent uh, elections. It's probable, I understand that it won't go through, but it still might. And obviously we don't know what will happen after the next elections. Um, interestingly, there's some fun wrangling that even goes on even within, even amongst the US Democrats. So when the EU um, was at quite a late stage in the DMA, Gina Raimondo, who is the Secretary of, for Commerce, wrote a letter to the EU saying this is a, a profoundly anti-American regulation and it's, you know, absolutely terrible um, because obviously the five biggest firms are American, um, at which point Elizabeth Warren, same party, um, wrote to her to say this is exactly what we're trying to do in the US. Um, and indeed, our regulation would only cover those five firms too. So please basically shut up. Um, so interesting uh, that. Then also very interesting, and I'm not enough on top of this, but in the paper, I do try and say as much as I can about it, given I'm not that on top of it. But in China, the state administ in 2021, the State Administration for Market Regulation also published well it's done two things it's published some competition at competition law guidelines that really help target competition law if more effectively at platforms and they have been finalized so competition law has made been made stronger in china in this space but they also published these draft guidelines which if finalized would create basically um, regulation not dissimilar to that proposed in the West, although their regulation seems to cover both the comp pro-competition aspects that the DMA covers and some of the content uh, issues that the Digital Services Act covers. And in the paper, there's links uh, to the draft. So we, we've got this regulation coming and lots of places internationally are looking at this. Uh, what are the design challenges of creating this sort of regulation? Um, remembering 
that this regulation is intended to complement and not substitute antitrust. So we're still going to have antitrust. But the key aims are to be quicker and more administrable than antitrust and to proactively open up markets. So to deal with that kind of um, blockaded uh, competition issue and not just to protect against further worsening. But that desire to be quick um, and be quite interventionist does obviously raise some risks. I've put Mark Zuckerberg's famous quote here of move fast and break things unless you're breaking stuff, you're not moving fast enough. Um, uh, he probably didn't mean that he wanted regulation to also move fast and break things. So obviously we don't really want to be breaking things, but equally there is there are real risks on the other side. If we're too cautious, the best could be the enemy of the good. Um, and this is just to bring this out. I mean, many commentators have highlighted concerns, um, have highlighted regulatory risks um, that it regular, sorry, have highlighted concerns that regulation risks being insufficiently based on firm economic evidence to one size fits all um, and that it risks creating unintended harm. And clearly that is true. Those risks are genuine, but there are other risks too. The more that we try and do things right and get the best answer, we have to collect evidence. Um, evidence collection takes time. If we try and create bespoke rules, if we try and allow for proportionality defenses, all of that creates the kind of legal quagmires and the time that we end up seeing in competition cases. Also, of course, in competition cases, we usually are keen, well, not always keen, but we are willing to accept efficiency defences. We think the competition law should allow for efficiency defences. One of the interesting things about this situation with the blockaded competition set of issues is that efficiencies are actually part of the problem. And therefore, you don't really want to have efficiency defences if efficiencies are creating the competition harm. So on balance, there is this kind of trade off between spe speed and administrability and getting the best answer. And what I'm going to say about some of the different jurisdictions is that I think a lot of what you see in the different approaches is different places trying to get to a, reach the right balance between speed and administrability on the one hand and at least a better answer on the other hand, recognizing that the best is, is, is impossible. Um, so some of the key questions in regulatory design. Um, the first is around the objectives, and I'm not gonna talk about the objectives in any detail. There's a fair amount of discussion in the paper. But really, um, I think that we would all agree that the most important aspect of that this regulation should be about is innovation. It's about trying to make sure that we have an environment in which the kind of fast and effective innovation that we've seen in the past um, is, is preserved, that disruptive competitors with great new ideas can actually make some headway and win customers. The trouble is, is that a good objective for regulation? And the problem is it's really very hard to ever evidence. We know that from trying to run dynamic effects cases in mergers, um, it's it's really tricky. So actually what um, the various regulations have sought to do is try and get proxies for what they think will provide a framework in which regulation will occur. Um, and so, you know, in, in Brussels, there's contestability and fairness, and in particular, the contestability aspect of that is about is is really about trying to create a framework within which um, firms with great ideas can can be successful. Um, then the question uh, of scope, which is which firms to regulate, and I will come back to that. And then the question of rules, which, how bespoke to be with your rules, how much flexibility to retain and what conduct to address and, and how. Um, and I'm going to talk about this incredibly 
quickly because I want to get onto the, um, the risks and the mitigations of fragmented approach. But just to highlight in terms of the scope, the challenge in terms in terms of setting the scope is, I mean, it's really good to ensure quality so that uh, clarity so that firms that are regulated know that they're regulated and they know which bits of their activity are regulated. Um, and that is going to be achieved through pre-designation uh, within all of the proposals. And that's very different to antitrust, where in antitrust, you know, dominant firms are covered, but you never really know if you're a dominant firm unless you end up <laughs> in a case and you have dominant proved against you. So here you're going to know whether you're subject to the rules. Then it's good to ensure a narrow scope because we know this is pretty interventionist law and we know that it was motivated by really quite a small number of firms. And so actually, you know, we want to keep it pretty narrow, but how many, how small is narrow, how few? And then how flexible do, was, do, do we want to be on that? Do we, more flexibility clearly facilitates future proofing, it can enhance proportionality but it can reduce administrability again and recognizing that administrability is important. And just to highlight that different places, I'm gonna focus on the US, UK and EU have taken different approaches. So the US approach, at least in the current proposals is purely quantitative and it would currently capture the top five US firms only there is no flexibility um, to expand that or to change it over time. I think the number there may be some flexibility to change precise numbers over, over time, but not anything else. Um, the UK approach, by contrast, is a mostly qualitative approach. There is intended now to be a minimum revenue threshold, but there's a focus on finding substantial and entrenched market power and a strategic position. Um, and so actually the requirement <laughs> to find market power is quite a big deal. It's, it's not unlike having to find dominance. Um, and so that raises the threshold, you know, makes it a lot harder for the UK. Um, but I think that, you know, it arguably it's more proportionate. It's also fully flexible. So if new firms come up or if new issues are arised, you can be flexible with that um, framework. It could capture more than the top five. It actually could capture less than the top five. Um, so we will see. Um, and then the EU approach is, I actually have a lot of admiration for the EU approach. I like it. I think that, so it's a, it, it's, it gets the administrability by having a quantitative rebuttable presumption. So it automatically brings in a whole set of firms and activities automatically, but then it's semi-flexible because that presumption can be rebutted on qualitative grounds. And you can also designate firms that fall outside the quantitative thresholds uh, via qualitative analysis. So I like that approach. What I'm less, um, what I like less about that approach is that currently it's thought likely to capture around 15 firms. And that seems far too many to me. It seems much more, many more than the firms that have uh, provided the impetus for this regulation. Um, I think that some of those have come in kind of by accident and the uh, de designation process is, is ongoing really with the commission now and I suspect that what they're doing is trying to actually accept rebuttals find ways to accept rebuttals um for some of those firms so that they get in mostly the firms that they first thought of um, but we will have to see where that ends up and then in terms of conduct rules what are we trying to address here I think that for all of the regulations there's basically two areas of two core areas of focus the first is interventions that are designed to open up um, currently monopolized or duopoly, duopolized markets to new competition. And that's interventions along the lines of interoperability, data access and portability, measures to enhance multi-homing. Um, and that is very aligned with the contestability objective of um, uh, the EU regular of the DMA. 
And then there's a second area of focus, which is interventions that are designed to stop existing strong market positions from being either leveraged into new markets or just exploited. Um, and that's where you get into things like pro prohibitions on self-preferencing, rules relating to tying and discrimination more generally. You can't draw a really clear line between these two because many of the provisions will do a bit of both, um, but you can they, they kind of do more of one or the other. And that second is closer to um, the thinking around fairness, the fairness objective and the Digital Markets Act. Um, another key challenge with the rules is do you want to make them standard or do you want to make them bespoke to so that the day the one size fits all of, across firms or are they bespoke? Um, are they fixed or are they flexible? Um, what we know is that the sorry, are they fixed over time or should they be flexible over time? What we know is that the firms have a lot of similarities. Um, a lot of the economics that apply to these firms are similar, but there are also some really obvious differences. So even where they provide similar functions, they can have different, different business models. So Google and Apple obviously both uh, run app stores and both have mobile operating systems and mobile browsers, uh, but Google is primarily ad funded, whereas Apple relies primarily on device sales, although it does get quite a chunk of ad funding. Um, does this matter? Should we should that um, affect uh, the rules that apply? But more generally, things like you know Amazon is a, is doing something very very different again. Microsoft is doing something pretty different again. Um, and there is a risk that rules that are suitable for <clears throat> one firm or one activity within a firm may be unsuitable for another. So that raises this challenge of how bespoke to make the rules. Um, and the um, and then there's this also this challenge that our, our thinking about these uh, issues and our understanding of these markets and these markets themselves all are changing and they can change over really quite a short space of time. We need to make sure the regulations are going to be appropriate in three, five, ten years time and not just today, um, <laughs> even if today. Um, and so how flexible or revisable should they be? And again, the different jurisdictions have taken different approaches here. So the US has basically got a one size fits all, uh, very high level rule banning self-preferencing. It's actually so high level, I'm, I'm pretty uncomfortable with it myself. Um, I don't quite know what it means. Um, and then, um, it, but it's very standard, very inflexible, wouldn't change. The UK, as I've described, generally is uh, it, it, it's true in, desig in designation. It's also true in the rules. Um, it's very bespoke, very flexible. The legislation would only set very high level objectives. It would then be for the regulator to develop the core principles and the legally binding requirements based on those. It would be an ev a bespoke evidence based approach. Um, it also would have powers to impose specific company specific uh, pro specific, uh, pro competitive interventions where practicable and proportionate. Um, so again, much better in some ways, but arguably much hard, much less easily administrable. And then the EU has got this kind of halfway house again, where it has um, twenty two what they think are pretty specific uh, rules, um, but at least some of them can be further specified in discussion with uh, the, and they're set out in legislation, but uh, more than half of them can be further specified by the commission in conversation uh, with them, um, uh, with a view to ensuring that the measures are effective and proportionate. The rules can be revised over time, um, and uh, there is also specific anti-avoidance uh, provisions and requirements that they be effective, both of which are useful in um, preventing gaming, but also just making sure that if the wording in the law isn't quite right, they still have um, th their broad uh, effect. Um, Summary views that people have about these two uh, areas. Many economists like uh, the UK DMU approach because it's seen as bespoke, flexible, 
that allows for participative debate, allows for proportionality. Um, and they dislike the EU approach because it's seen as one size fits all. Um, there's insufficient uh, potential for engagement, although I would say that has actually improved in the final Digital Markets Act, at least to some extent. And there's little role for proportionality, although there is some. I think in practice, these are going to be more similar than they seem on the surface. They're basically addressing similar issues. So I think the rule book may end up fairly aligned. And the big question is going to be administrability. That said, even there, I think they may end up more similar. The EU claims that its laws are going to be self-executing. I think for the most part, they're gonna need quite a lot of engagement uh, with the firms. Uh, and I think it's gonna be an ongoing process of working out exactly what they mean. So I don't think it's as self-executing as, as is suggested. Likewise, the UK is going to have a whole system of deadlines and reverse burdens of proof, which will hope for, well, the, are intended to have the effect of enabling a, a more bespoke approach while retaining um, effective administrability, which in turn is going to, if you're gonna do, do things on a quick basis, it's going to limit how much um, evidence you can really put in. So they may not end up being so very different. So I wanna get on, cause I spent too long on that. So. So I've said already um, that there are, even though these jurisdictions are trying to do the same thing, there are already differences that we've seen there between the EU, the UK, the US, and the other jurisdictions I haven't talked about have also take are also to the extent that we know taking slightly different approaches. And there's a number of factors pushing towards this kind of divergence. The one is that actually there's no single right answer. I hope that what I've conveyed so far is that there's a problem and there are different solutions to the same problem, but it's not obvious that any one of those solutions is the right solution. Then jurisdictions also have different legal, political and cultural perspectives. So the US, for example, is very anti-regulation. Even the bill proposals that it has are not formally termed regulation in the way that the EU is perfectly happy to call its regulation regulation. Um, there are political factors at play. So for example, I'm fairly confident <clears throat> that one of the reasons that the EU has ended up with so many firms in scope is because they didn't want to end up with only the top five firms in scope because they didn't want to only have five US firms. They were kind of desperate to have at least some EU firms so that they didn't look like they're being protectionist. So I think they're basically going to end, book, poor booking is going to end regulated basically because it's EU and they, they want to include a EU firm. Um, likewise, the UK is going to have a different approach. Um, you know, I, I can't help thinking that the government quite likes the regulation now, not because of its, its substantive um, virtues, but just because it's different to the EU approach and the UK government is desperately looking for different legislation post Brexit. Um, and there are also linkages with other policy areas, data protection, IP, which themselves vary across jurisdictions. <clears throat> and there are also differences in timing, of course. So as first mover, I think, I mean, Germany is kind of the first mover, but <clears throat> for proper regulation, the EU is the first mover. And I think it's therefore going to be very influential, even if it shouldn't be, if you see what I mean, just because it's first. I think it's going to require things and that that is going to then change the incremental costs of for firms of doing things in other jurisdictions. And that is then going to change the regulations that both the firms are arguing for, but also that the ju other jurisdictions feel justified in imposing in their own, um, in their own jurisdictions. There's also uh, issues around firm lobbying, um, and that may get more that that may get more effective over time. I'm told that one of the reasons that the EU was very keen to get the DM DMA done and dusted is that they felt that big tech were getting um, better with their lobbying efforts, and if they didn't get it done quickly, uh, they might then get to a position where they couldn't get it done at all. So, is this good or bad? This 
risk of divergence. There can be some benefits of a fragmented regulatory approach. So if you have a comparison of, appro of approaches across different jurisdictions, you know, economists are happy because we can do all sorts of um, difference in difference analysis, um, and that can yield lessons uh, that improve regimes over time. And it can be possible for regimes that are designed somewhat differently to function well together. So merger control is a nice example. I mean, people who are merger specialists will complain that they're not sufficiently well aligned, but broadly they work, uh, the different merger regimes work well together. Um, moreover, finding a coherent global approach would, almost, would just take a huge amount of time. And we know that time is in short supply here. So if we're gonna do anything, it's, gonna, it's global is just not realistic. <laughs> Um, but there are still risks. The risks partly depend on the decisions that are going to be made by the platforms. So the nature and extent of those risks will depend on whether firms decide whether to comply only, uh, comply only within a relevant jurisdiction, as is legally required, or comply on a wider geographic basis, kind of voluntarily. Um, and that in turn is gonna depend on the nature of the regulations. Some regulations such as the um, interconnection, messaging interconnection requirements in the DME, DMA, it's quite hard to even understand how they could only work in the EU, given that EU users want to interconnect messaging wise outside the EU. So the nature of the regulation might inherently have extraterritorial effects. There may be technical costs with having a fragmented approach. With interoperability, you might want to just have one system of interoperability and have the same thing globally, if the, which will be what the EU requires if the EU has made requirements. Um, there may be reputational risks of taking different approaches in different jurisdictions because users may think that you're being that you're not treating them well if you don't give them as good a deal in their particular jurisdiction. And there may be regulatory risks as well. If you are clearly doing some things in some jurisdictions, but not in others, that may raise the likelihood that those latter jurisdictions uh, decide to introduce their own regulation. In practice, I think that the firms are likely to take, take a mix and match approach towards these different rules. For some things, they will do it very locally. So app store pricing or whatever, that very locally, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, not much cost in doing that. Things like interoperability, much more likely to do that on a global or at least a, a wide geographic basis. If we do end up with fragmentation, um, that can lead to big risks. It can be one of the biggest things is it can be very unhelpful for rivals who are seeking to compete because they've got to compete with something with, uh, with firms that are doing different things in different jurisdictions. They'll have different access uh, possibilities, different payments, et cetera. And recall that the regulation is intended to be about promoting competition and innovation. So you want to, you don't want to make it as unhelpful for those rivals. It also could increase the costs for the regulatory, the regulated firms, both regulatory costs of compliance, but also just the technical costs of designing their systems. And that could in turn impact on their prices, quality or innovation. It could lead to them to just increase their focus on compliance rather than actually providing a good service. This is something that people sometimes say has happened in financial services where firms are very focused on compliance with the regulatory rules and not necessarily about making their users happy. Um, uh, and then there are risks of regulatory inconsistency between jurisdictions or even creating a regulatory edifice where every single regulatory jurisdiction wants to add something of their own and kind of you just create a mountain of regulation. So final slide, I realize I'm out of time. I think there are some mitigations. In theory, um, you know, we it would be wonderful to have global platform regulation. I said I don't given these are global firms I've said I don't think these are that's unrealistic I think it's really unrealistic and, I, and it may not even be a good idea even if it was practicable because who would run it how would it be governed how big would the risk be of regulatory capture etc um, but it may be feasible in specific areas so for example we might be able to uh, we might end up and there already is some of this having global standard setting for APIs 
You might want global international trans, into, uh, global transparency standards about what is put into the public domain and how, um, and global standards on, for example, how to audit algorithms, a bit like kind of standard international audit standards. Um, some of these extraterritorial effects may be helpful in creating a more harmonized um, uh, effects around the world. You may be able to mitigate these issues if different jurisdictions just copy out legislation from other jurisdictions. And that has been broadly the case in competition policy where different jurisdictions have basically just written out the words of either the EU or the US uh, law. Um, and so there's a lot of harmonization. There is the potential to use competition law in jurisdictions that don't have regulation to attain some benefits of regulation that would so obviously you can more likely to get a firm to agree to a commitment if the incremental cost to them of doing those commitments because they're already doing them somewhere else where they're regulated is lower and that might lead to um, a degree of consistency internationally via different legal frameworks you might also, and we're already seeing a lot of engagement between jurisdictions on the substance, what are the issues, what are the pros and cons of different regulatory options if we're going to go be doing this. And that's there are kind of lots of debates, um, for example, within the uh, uh, OECD. And then co the real goal would be coordinated enforcement um, that would require at least memoranda of understanding between jurisdictions, ideally uh, information gateways so they can share confidential information and even better the ability to bring joint cases as different states can in the US or to delegate cases between them as different member states can in the EU under the European Competition Network. And sorry I went three minutes over time I will stop there but I hope um, there was something interesting in there. So it's quite interesting thank you Amelia and we have Paul Bellaflam uh, as our discussant. Looking forward to that. Thank you. Thanks a lot for the presentation and the paper. It is very interesting indeed. And especially what I found interesting was the, the two last uh, sections on design challenges and on the risk of the divergences between jurisdictions. Um, and you raise many, many questions. Um, so it's very hard for me to come up with a uh, another set of questions. So let me try to rephrase things in, in the way I've been teaching them for, for quite a number of years now. Uh, when you deal with markets with network effects, uh, um, usually I teach the, the kind of contrast there is between competition for the market and competition in the market, uh, telling my, my audience that if you have competition for the market, you're going to have a lot of competition beforehand in order to become the winner, but then competition will phase out or, or disappear completely. Whereas if you have compatibility to start with, competition will be in the market and you are kind of a, you have a guarantee of competition remaining, maybe at a lower level than if, if you had competition for the market, but at least competition is going to remain. Now, as you said, we are probably in a situation where competition for the markets existed and um, five big winners emerged and they've kind of killed competition uh, nowadays. But also, as you as you say, perhaps more clearly in the presentation than in the paper, they've created a lot of value for their users, and probably this is a result of very tough competition between them and other companies uh, before that. Now, it's I think it's also fair to say that the regulation which is proposed would be a, a way to re restore some kind of competition in the market, um, or at least to come up with some some mixture between the two, so keeping some form of competition for the market for some aspects while having competition in the market for other aspects. Uh, but then uh, it seems that we are facing this kind of conundrum that on the one hand, the current situation is such that there is an inability for other firms to compete. But I'm wondering whether there is an interest for other firms to compete if they foresee that later uh, markets will remain contestable. Um, so this is a kind of basic question and I have and another question relates to innovation. And here, I think there is a sense of making a distinction between those big tech firms that control hardware. And I think of uh, Microsoft uh, and, and Apple, basically, and other firms that operate what I would call pure two-sided platforms. So if I think of pure two-sided platforms, whose main value is to let people interact, uh, I think the biggest innovation is just 
well, not just, but achieving uh, the, or making it possible for, for people, to, for users to interact. And there are not that many ways to do that, right? So any other innovation would be incremental. But organizing interaction between buyers and sellers like Amazon is doing, I don't think there are so many ways to do it, right? Um, same thing for if you think of uh, Uber or Airbnb, there are not so many ways to organize the interaction between the participants. Of course, they've come up with innovation, but there are incremental innovations. Whereas innovations in terms of hardware, this is where you would find uh, more uh, basic and um, and um, yeah, I don't find the term, not incremental innovation. So if this is, and I agree with you that this is hard to make innovation an objective in itself, but this is still at the core of, of the, the reaction we have nowadays, seeing that these companies may uh, kill innovation and competition at the same time. So basically, these are my two questions. So what would be the remedy or the kind of result of uh, regulation? Is it a mixture between competition for and in the market? And what type of innovation do we do we need to have in mind uh, if we have this dynamic point of view um, at, uh, in mind? Thank you. <laughs>